several songs that are in our Baptist hymnal. Some of them you probably know. Blessed Assurance, Rescue the Perishing, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, to God be the glory. Those are just a small number of the songs she wrote. Over her lifetime, she wrote more than 8,000 songs, gospel songs and hymns. But she was more than just a songwriter. She was active in rescue mission work in New York City, helping the sick, the poor, prisoners, the lowly, many others, the neglected, and the blind. For she herself lived her entire life in physical blindness. But she said later in life that if perfect earthly sight were offered me, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had ever seen or been distracted by all the things around me. And she further said, when I get to heaven, the first face that shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. We're going to do another one of her songs here. Mike's going to help me out a little bit. If you know it, please feel free to sing along with us. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain.
There's something I'd like to share with you. You know, I, uh, in case you're wondering why I kind of hang out back there, it's because I have a group of guys come back there and pray with me, which is extremely important to me in the morning before we come and present the Word of God. But I was standing back there today, and I was just observing what God was doing in our midst. Uh, we had a uh, watcher on the wall get up and remind us some things about what's going on in our society, reminding us that it's our responsibility as watchers, uh, as Christians who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God, to remember something, that the restrainer will keep on restraining until he is taken out of the way. It's part of our responsibility as believers to be used to restrain the evil that will come in our society, because watch this, there's a time coming after the rapture, during the tribulation, when the restrainer will not restrain, and this world will see a time of unprecedented evil. And so it falls to us to help to restrain, to season our society, okay? I observed that today. I also observed uh, Brandon Giles get up. He and his wife, Tina, are very very passionate about winning souls to Jesus and to make sure that children are exposed to the gospel. I was encouraged by that. Uh, I watched as we were led in worship today, taken to the throne of grace by people that are passionate about worship. And I couldn't help but think, whether we're talking about uh, prophetic events and awareness of that, or we're talking about winning people to Jesus and being reminded of what our mission is as a church, or whether it be being led to the throne of grace today, how beautiful is the body of Christ? How beautiful. All of you have different passions. All of you have different spiritual giftedness. And to see the Lord bring those things together in a beautiful harmony, uh, it's a sight to see. That has nothing to do with the message today. We're in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. We're talking about the great I Am statements. And today we're going to take a look at John, chapter 15, and see what our Lord has to say there. Uh, you don't have to turn to this, but if we could go ahead and pull up that passage from the book of Isaiah, we're going to use this as a backdrop to jump in this morning. The Bible says in Isaiah, chapter 5, My well-beloved has a vineyard. On a very fruitful hill, he dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. He, so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Israel was supposed to bear fruit. Israel was supposed to fulfill God's plan for the world, and they failed in their mission to represent God in this world. But guess what? God would be represented, and he would be represented through his son. By the way, it is your mission and my mission this morning to represent him and to represent him well. But because Jesus understood that after the prophets had written, after everything that had been foretold leading up to his first coming was at hand, at just the right time, he was born into this world. And he was born to reveal the Father to mankind. That's why he came. And with the failure of the nation of Israel in view, he comes to make this statement that we begin with today. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. 
I want to propose this morning that if you and I will abide in the great I am, then you will glorify God through fruit bearing. If you and I abide in the great I am, then we will glorify God through fruit bearing. Let's pray together. Father, our lives are no longer our own, for we have been bought with a price. We are to glorify you, and we are to love you with our heart, all of our heart, our soul and our mind and our strength. And just as the nation of Israel had a mission, a mission which up until now they have not fulfilled, you are determined that you will be revealed to this world. And we thank you that you sent Jesus in when the fullness of the times had come so that he could show the world what God was like. But Lord Jesus, you've ascended back up into heaven now. And you have a mission for your church. And that is to represent you and to represent you well. So that when all the world asks the question, what is God like? By the grace of God, they can take a look at my life and the lives of your followers. And they'll say, oh, that's what God is like. This responsibility, our Father, is heady. And it's impossible. It's too much for us. But I pray that you would show us today that if we abide in you, you have promised that we are going to bear fruit, the type of fruit that you want us to bear, so that people will get saved and all the world will glorify your great name. Help us to see the need today to abide. And Father, the truth of the matter is, I'm weak, and I need you. I pray that your strength would be perfected in my weakness, and that you would meet with us today in spite of me. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I am the vine. John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. All right, so here's the picture. Uh, Jesus and his disciples have just finished the Last Supper. They're in the upper room. Soon they would be crossing over the Kidron Valley. They would ascend the Mount of Olives as they make their way to Gethsemane. I can see them in my mind's eye, in my imagination, passing by a vineyard with rows and rows of grapes, if you want to pull that picture up, of grapevines with their branches uh, growing along wooden fences. Maybe the grapes were already in clusters on the branches, uh, would have been appropriate at that time and that season. And Jesus points to the fruit that the vines are producing through the branches, and as he did so, he makes this statement, I am the true vine. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, the farmer. You see, they understood this analogy well. All right, these disciples may not have been farmers. They may not have personally owned vineyards, but they did live in, agri in an agricultural society. They were used to seeing uh, olive groves. They were used to seeing uh, seasonal fruit. They were definitely used to seeing vineyards. So they would, they would get this. They would understand the analogy. They understood that vineyards required tending, and that tending those vines included cultivation and pruning. Jesus says, He takes away every branch in me that bears no fruit. I don't want you to get the wrong idea of what Jesus is saying there. 
You know, we, we have the, the idea that he just does away with them. That's not what the text is saying. Takes away can also be translated, he lifts them up. And here's kind of the idea. They lived in a very dry climate, okay, where you would have rainy seasons. The climate, for the most part, was dry. And what they would do in order to conserve the moisture is that they would allow, the farmers would allow the vines to run along the ground so that they could conserve moisture. And whenever the blossoms began appearing, then the farmer would lift up the vines and would place them on the fences, on the stones, on the rocks, whatever it is that they were using, would lift them up off the ground so that the blossoms could germinate, so that they could bear fruit. Those that are already bearing fruit will be pruned. You know, I, was, uh, I like to go visit Farmer Jenkins sometimes. Is he here? may not be here today. I love to go over to his his orchard, by the way. And as I go, I often make my way over there in the very early spring, sometimes in the latter part of winter, whenever he's pruning. He knows exactly what to do. He knows exactly where to cut. Uh, He does a lot of that pruning himself because he wants it done right. He knows that in order to get the type of harvest that he's looking for, that pruning is absolutely necessary. You know why? Because the old growth needs to be removed to make room for the new growth. Now, beyond this, dust was everywhere in this society. Remember when Jesus makes the statement that you could literally, the idea is you could literally just have had a bath, but all you have to do is walk out your door, okay, and go down a dusty road for just a minute, and your feet need to be washed. A dusty place dry climate. And what would happen in those days is that the farmer not only had to do pruning to remove old growth, but they would literally take sponges and wash off a lot of the leaves because those leaves would collect dust and the dust would get in the way of proper fruit bearing. He would also have to remove insects from the leaves. We all know what damage insects can do to things that we're trying to to grow. So the farmer had a lot of work to do. If the vine is healthy and the farmer is attentive and the branches stay connected, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to bear a lot of fruit. The vines, the branches are going to do exactly what they are supposed to do. They are designed to bear fruit. Understand something, church. Jesus is the vine. God the Father is the vine dresser, and you and I, we are the branches. We exist for one purpose, and that is to bear fruit, to bear fruit. The Father lifts us up through his sovereign hand and places us where he wants us so that we can bear fruit. You're sitting here in a church at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church today, October the 16th, 2022. Do you know why you're here? Because God the Father, through His sovereign hand, has placed you here. You are exactly where He wants you, and you are strategically placed because He has one desire for you, and that is for you to bear fruit. Bloom where you're planted. Amen? Now, the Father cultivates our lives in order to make us fruitful. He takes the word of God just like he would take a sponge and clean all the dust and the dirt and the grime off of those leaves. He takes the word of God and he uses that to cleanse us so that we can bear the type of fruit that he wants us to bear. By the way, sometimes parasites get in the way in our Christian life as well. Amen? And those parasites, those insects, have to be removed. All you have to do is walk out your door and you interact with some people out in this world and sometimes you're going to feel dirty because you've been affected by the things of this world. That's why it is so very important for us to allow the vine dresser who has designed us to bear fruit, optimal fruit, to be able to do in us what needs to be done, whether it is cultivating or washing. 
The Bible says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. The, the point that Jesus is making is this, and he'll make this point again in the following verses. Branches are supposed to bear fruit. That's what a grapevine does. If there is no fruit, then the problem is not with the vine. You know why? Because Jesus is the vine, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with him. Amen? And the problem is not with the farmer, because God the Father is the farmer. And if we cooperate with the vine dresser and let him do in us what needs to be done, then we will bear fruit. If the branch, therefore, is not bearing fruit, and it's not God the Father's fault, and it's not Jesus' fault, then there's one possibility left. It's my fault. And it's your fault. And the reason that a branch would not bear fruit is that it is not properly connected to the vine. Because if it's not connected to the vine, it's not going to receive the nourishment that the vine has to offer, and it will not bear fruit. Healthy branches produce fruit. It's what they've been designed to do. Unhealthy branches do not bear fruit. You know what happens to them? They get cut off. Now, Jesus is the true vine, and we are the branches. Can I remind you that he is the one that saved you? He himself is the source of your everlasting life. And just as you couldn't save yourself, you can't bear fruit by yourself. He is the source of your life, and He is the source of your fruit. Therefore, we must stay connected to Him if we are to do what we've been designed to do. And by the way, He placed us in His own body to accomplish that very purpose. If you're here and you're saved, you belong to the body of Jesus Christ. And you were placed in that body so that you could get what you need in order to do what you've been called to do. And that's why Jesus says, abide. And I propose this morning that if you abide in the great I am, then you will glorify God through fruit bearing. Take a look with me at verse 4. Because of all this that we've said, because Jesus is the true vine, because God the Father is the vine dresser, because you and I are the branches, and having learned what we have just learned about fruit bearing, Jesus says this in verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Jesus says, abide. Remain in me. Stay connected to me. That idea of staying connected to Jesus, of abiding in Jesus, is so that all that Jesus is can flow into you. And as I stay connected to him and all that he is is flowing into me, then guess what? I cannot help but bear fruit because I am in intimate union with Jesus Christ. And he tells us, remain in intimacy, in intimate union with him, practically from day to day. All right, Pastor Steve, you know what? That sounds awesome. I understand that Jesus is the vine. I know that God the Father is the vine dresser. I know that I'm the branch. I want to stay connected to him. I want to bear fruit, but you know what? I struggle sometimes. How do I abide? Jesus commands, abide in me. I want to. I don't know how. We're about to tell you, okay? This is the how of abiding. This is how to stay connected. First of all, give Jesus control of your body. Give him control of your body. 
John 14, 16. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Guess what? We've been admonished to abide in him, but guess what? He abides in us. He abides in us. God lives in our body from the moment that you receive Jesus. By the way, where's Betty? I saw her a while ago. Betty? Betty, 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 where are you? Raise your hand. There she is. Hi, Betty. Betty, I'm going to embarrass you. I I do that a lot here at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church, okay? Guess what? Betty got saved last night. And, amen. Amen. Betty, the moment that that Jesus spoke your name and brought you alive from the dead, he started living inside of you. And he abides with you, and he promised that he's going to abide with you forever. That he'll never leave you. He'll never turn his back on you. And so when Jesus gives you a command, abide in me, you can do that because he already abides in you. You don't have the power to stay connected to him. You don't have the power to abide in him. But guess what? My God is the God of the impossible. And if everything that he is is flowing into you, then you will find yourself living the very life of God himself. And your thoughts will become his thoughts Your words will become his words. His very life will be lived out through you and you will have the power by the grace of God to do what is not possible for you to do. Give Jesus control over your body. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus said, and I've declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. See, God lives in us to make us more Christ-like. Paul said, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. It's a done deal. He has purposed that he's going to finish the good work that he started in you until the coming of Jesus Christ. So if we surrender our bodies to him and say, God, here is my body. I present it to you as a living sacrifice. Glorify yourself in my body. Then your body will become his temple. Jesus, live out your life through this body. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So give Jesus control of your body, but next, give yourself over to expert hands. I don't know about you, but I don't particularly get excited about being pruned in my life. I'm the vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear good fruit, he takes away He lifts up so that they can bear fruit. And every branch that is already bearing fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You see, God the Father, Papa Jay, has has determined that he's going to make you more like Jesus. You've been following Jesus a long time, right? Because you're about 110, 111. Okay. Oh, don't feel sorry for him. He picks on me all the time. That's why he chastens us. That's why he corrects us. That's why he prunes us. That's why he removes the parasites. He nips here. He completely severs there. He twists and he ties in my life and in yours for his own divine purpose. The awesome awesome thing about this process, Jeff, is that it is so lovingly endurable because he is so lovingly condescending to do this in me and to take the time to do this in you. You know what? I know that my Father in heaven loves me because he is so lovingly condescending towards me and he puts up with all my nonsense. Picture in your mind 
a vine dresser, coming alongside each vine with his pruning shears, he has to get in close to the vine. He's very, he or she are, are very deliberate, very methodical in the moves that they make. He wants the branch to be the best that it can be, the best quality that it can be after his own design. Kind of reminds me of Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> you ever seen the Karate Kid? You know, when he's doing his thing on the little bonsai trees, whatever. That wasn't part of my sermon, by the way. <laughs> you know, the vine dresser cuts off only what is absolutely necessary. He applies only necessary pain to the branch so that it become all that it's intended to be. And in this, we see the very careful attention of our vine dresser as he wraps his loving arms around us and he prunes each branch. Like a loving father who is embracing his child, he knows just what to do. He gives us his own expert care. Next, give your minds to God. Did you know that you can learn to think like God thinks? I don't know about you. But I don't think I'm alone in this. You all, you all know Harold Vaughn? He wrote a, a booklet one time. I can't remember the exact title. But the, the basic idea was, God help me with these, with these evil thoughts. Evil thoughts can come into your mind. Sick thoughts can come into your mind, if you're honest. Terrible thoughts. Thoughts that you would think, oh my goodness, where did that even come from? Struggles that you could have. Daydreams that you can have if your mind is left unguarded. Lord, would a Christian even think about stuff like this? Have you ever asked yourself that one? You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy or something. I know it's church and we need to put on our church face, right? We can learn to think as Jesus thinks. Did you know that as you abide in Jesus, then he will take control over your thoughts and help you to think as God thinks? You see, it's real easy to pass over Scripture, but that's what we're talking about whenever, whenever 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Philippians 2.5, Because of you abiding in God and he abiding in you, Paul is able to say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The opportunity is there for you and I in any situation that we find ourselves in in life. The opportunity is there for us to be able to think like God as we abide in him. And we'll know what to do in the situations of life. But it's when we're operating outside of Christ and we're not relying upon him to help us with our thoughts, then we can make some really stupid decisions in life. Okay? Really dumb decisions. But our Savior, who lives in us, can teach us how to discipline our minds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. There are lots of strongholds that can be built up in your mind. There are lots of patterns that will go on in your brain that are not from God. But God is willing to teach you how to think and to take control over your mind. And he will teach you how to cast down those ungodly thoughts that are not from him. Do you know that? He will teach you to take control of your thought life. He'll teach you how to take every thought captive, which is not from God. And your mind can be purified if you allow him to do the work in you that he wants to do. So whether we're talking about someone who uh, is struggling as a young person as their hormones are playing ping pong with their brain and they need to be able to think pure 
or whether we're talking about someone who was just so angry and so bitter because of what so-and-so did to them or what so-and-so said to them or because someone got cheated out of this or that, God can teach you how to let go of those things so that they no longer dominate you so that you will be free to live and to think and to be like God. If I surrender my mind to Christ, then he can gain control over my desires. Philippians 2.13, watch this. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. That verse, Pastor Steve, is worth meditating on. Did you know that God is in you even when it concerns your own human will so that he will cause you to desire those things that he desires? He will give you the ability to desire what is right and the ability to do what is right according to all the plans that I have for my life. No, according to his good pleasure. You know why? Because my life is not about me anymore. I'm no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. Amen? Amen. I don't care what time it is. Give yourself to be filled with the fullness of God. (laughs) You see, Jesus has got an endless supply of sap in his vines. And he wants to let that flow through you as the branches. We are commanded in the word of God to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As we abide in Jesus, we will find ourselves through the abiding, being perpetually filled with the fullness of God. Because see, before we ever attempt to do, we must be. And the doing will flow from the being. And the being will come as you abide. And all that Jesus is, is flowing into you. That's why it's so very important for you and I to stay connected. Amen? Yeah. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, Colossians 2.10. And you are complete. That means that you are filled in him who was the head of all principality and power. Christ is in us, and because Christ is in us, there is nothing that he has commanded you to do which by his power you won't be able to do. All that he requires of himself, he will meet that in us and through us. But without him, we can't do anything, right? Without him, we can do nothing. But with him, we have everything at our disposal if we will simply learn to let him work. So what does it mean, Pastor Steve, to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God? Is that a charismatic thing? Nope. That's a Christian thing. (laughs) It's a Christian thing. It's not charismatic. It's not Baptist. It's a Christian thing. It means that no place is left empty. No place is left empty. I couldn't fill this glass up unless I poured out everything that was in it. That means all the junk in Pastor Steve has to go if Pastor Steve wants to do something for God. I can't do anything for God unless I'm filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And I can't be filled with the Holy Spirit of God if there is a measure of me left in me. I don't know about you, but my time is short here on this earth. And I want the things that I do to matter for eternity. That means that Pastor Steve's got to go. I, I, must, I must decrease, and he must increase in me. No place left empty. We must be so possessed, for lack of a better way to put it, by Christ that our life is completely lost in his life and in his fullness. <laughs> Can I be frank with you? The problem for a lot of us is that we're full of it, We're full of it, whatever it is, but we're not full of him. 
When you're filled with Christ, there's no room left for self or for sin for that matter. You see, in every saved person, there is a measure of Christ at all times. But what we're talking about now are those times where you are so filled to overflowing. That is when the true power of God is on display. And, and, and every human attempt at trying to manufacture the power of God is done away with. I want the genuine. So how can I be filled with Christ? I must be emptied. I must be emptied. This is akin to pruning. You see, Abraham had to sacrifice Isaac before the deepest longings of his heart would be fulfilled. Moses had to spend 40 years in the desert letting go of everything that he thought that he knew about being a prince of Egypt in order to become a prince with God. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God by simply yielding yourself to Him. By surrendering yourself to Him. That is what it means. And it's by knowing His Word, the Word of God, and skillfully using it. That's why Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so will you prove to be my disciples. You see, on a, on a, on a grapevine, the grapes come off the branches. The branches find all the nourishment that they need from the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And so if we want to bear fruit in our Christian lives, then we must stay connected to the vine. He's our lifeline. Abide in the great I am and you will glorify God through fruit bearing. But if the branch doesn't stay connected to the vine, then something's going to happen. Look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified. I want you to bear much fruit. And when you do, you'll prove to be my disciples. Sometimes, sometimes branches have to be removed from the vine if they're sterile. In other words, they are literally sucking the life out of the plant. Okay? They, they suck the life out of the branches, but yet they're not producing anything. They're just leaves. That's the problem that Jesus had with the, the fig tree, by the way. It was supposed to bear fruit, and it didn't produce fruit, and so he cursed it. You see, whenever you just got some branches that are just growing a bunch of leaves, and they're not doing what they are designed to do, they're not producing fruit, then something happens. They're removed. And those branches are thrown into the ovens to be used as fuel like when they're baking bread or something like that. Fire is representative of judgment in the Word of God. By way of application, you know, in the local church, you have saved people that genuinely are excited about living for God, right? We have a lot of those here at Mount Lebanon Baptist Church, a lot of servants that I'm, I'm looking out on you right now. But within every local church, uh, are those who are either unsaved or they are genuine believers who choose not to bear fruit. You've got both of those things in every local church. The danger of both of these possibilities is that God the Father, the vine dresser, see, he knows what's going on, and he will judge those types of branches and remove them. You know why? God may remove people from any local church because they are getting in the way of fruit bearing. And so I believe that you are brought here by the will of God. And I believe that sometimes when a person leaves a church, they are simply being cut out by the vine dresser because that person is getting in the way of fruit bearing in a local church. That's simply a reality. Okay? That's why I never will pressure you into joining this church. 
I invite you to, but I never pressure you to, because I want you here by the will of God. And if God doesn't want you here, then hopefully he's got somewhere else for you. God has determined that the branches here will bear fruit without distraction. And to that end, for the growing believer, what about what, about what he cuts away in your life? What happens to that? Okay? That is likewise thrown into the fire. It's cut away so that you can bear the type of fruit that you've been called to bear. And what gets cut away in your life, the junk, so to speak, that gets cut away in your life, this points to the coming judgment seat of Christ when all of your works pass through the fire of God's final analysis and what remains is your reward. You know what, there's a lot of things that I've done since I've become a Christ follower. And I want to tell you something. Hopefully more of what I've done for the sake of the cause of Christ has been just for that, because I love Jesus. But I guarantee you that there are things that I've done in the Christian life so that people would say, oh, Steve, you did a great job. Okay? Or for this reason, or for that reason. Anything that was not done for Jesus simply because I love him and want to see him glorified, guess what? All of that will pass through the fire. And what remains is what I did with a sincere heart and a pure motive. And guess what? The things that are burned away will never be heard from again. So that what we are left with going into eternity is a reward that was sincerely earned. I praise God for that. I praise God for that. I don't want my, my selfishness to be remembered, right? I don't want my bad motives in the Christian life to be remembered. I want them to be burned away. Jesus' will, in closing, is that we abide in him, and in so doing, to bear much fruit. If you abide in Jesus, I promise you, your prayers are going to be answered. You know why? Because as you abide in him and you learn to think like him and you learn to desire what he desires, then you'll find that your prayer life is going to be radically changed because you will be so in tune with him that you're going to want what he wants for your life and for the lives of others. And as you pray about that and you're prayer life is radically transformed, I guarantee you, you're going to see more and more yeses to the prayers that you pray. Does that make sense to you? That's a promise, by the way, from the Word of God. As we abide in Him and we pray to Him, He's going to answer our prayers. The result is fruitfulness. And you remember what I said a while ago about the vine dresser? coming along and having to kind of snuggle in close to make those adjustments in us. Can I tell you something that God loves that? And I love that too, although it's not always pleasurable being corrected or rebuked. But, but I do love the closeness. And in the end, this is what Jesus is inviting you to. He's, a, he's inviting you to abide in him. You know why? Because he loves you and he wants to be with you. Isn't that an awesome thought? Jesus wants to enjoy intimate fellowship with you day in and day out. He wants to be near you. There may be some people in your life that says, I don't want to go near that guy or that gal, but God's not like that. You already know that he's loved you with an everlasting love because he summoned you to himself and he brought you alive from the dead and chose you because he wanted you. You already know that he wants you, but be reminded today, he wants to be with you every day. He wants to hide you under the shadow of his wings. He wants to place you in his pavilion because he honestly enjoys being around you. Accept that. Embrace it. Praise God for it and live that way. Stay connected to him. Abide in him. And the result will be that you will bear more fruit than you can possibly imagine. And you know what? 
there's just something about abiding in Jesus that fills me with joy. You know why? Because in his presence is fullness of joy. This world can't offer that. But Jesus can. The longer I walk with Jesus, there's nothing that this world has to offer that can ever give me joy. And that's why the Apostle Paul and Silas could have nothing, possess nothing, and just have the living daylight beaten out of them in shame and humiliation. But Jesus was with them in that Philippian jail cell. And they were so filled with joy because they were in his presence that they sang. And people were saved. We'll be joyful people. Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life in your presence, fullness of joy. As the Father loved me, Jesus said, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Abide in the great I am, and you will glorify God through fruit-bearing. 